rolling countryside of Europe hides a secret. Beneath these farmlands lie graveyards, final resting place for the fallen of the First World War. No Man's Land is a group of archaeologists, forensic experts and historians. They excavate the past a shovelful at a time to preserve the memories of the shattered lives that ended here. This is something that no one's ever seen before. She's there, right? Yes. We've got it. At Ypres in northern Belgium, they are searching for evidence of the very first trenches of the Great War. I don't know if this is an arm or leg. No, I can't see. I've got part of a ball joint. Along the way, they discover the men who fought there and an atrocity that was committed. In the autumn of 1914, this Belgium farmland was a focus of fighting in the First World War. British, French and Belgian troops flooded in to face a vast German army. The Allies were desperate to capture the open land between the newly dug trenches in France and the coast to prevent the German army from capturing the vital channel ports, lifeline of the British army. It was also a battle to save the last major Belgium town in Allied hands, Ypres. Where we are now is at the small village of Bigsota, which is north of the town of Ypres. In 1914, the Germans' plan was to take Paris within about six weeks to knock out the French and then turn to their east and beat the Russians. They fail, and because of that, they start to dig in. Andy Robertshaw is an historian with Britain's National Army Museum and a member of No Man's Land, a team of battlefield experts here to try and find evidence of the first Great War trenches and the men who fought in them. They're using geophysical surveys and wartime maps to try and locate the original trenches. Overseeing it all is archaeologist David Kenyon. There are early aerial photographs from 1915 that show a German trench here. And we know that the site was captured by the Germans in October of 1914, during the first Battle of Ypres. These fields are where the infamous trench war of the Great War was born. Shallow graves that would be dug deeper and become home for troops on the front line. Eventually, the Great War's trenches, if measured foot by foot, would be long enough to encircle the Earth. No Man's Land is searching for one of the first. Their research leads them to the right spot, but reveals something else. Human remains. Andy? Andy? Is that little toe? I think, I think so, yeah. Yeah, you got the foot. Just, do you want to have a look first, just in, yeah. see what you think? Does, uh, does this, which is, I think, where the impression from where the heel came, and up here, in this area, with those, have you seen the two pieces of bone? Yes. Well, maybe we can remove the top soil to about... To about there, yeah, that might be a good idea. The team identifies a layer of earth that appears to contain the human remains. The machine operator is instructed to carefully scrape off the topsoil just above that level. But to their horror, the spoil is full of human bones, what's left of men killed here in the fight for Eve. Well, what's happened is, um, during the machining, mm -hmm. you know, using the big bucket, the, the bucket has pulled up um, what appears to be at least one individual. The bones stuck in there. Justin just found it on the spoil. It's a mistake that shouldn't happen. No man's land respect the dead and retrieve human remains painstakingly by hand. 
that's unfortunate, but it happens on any archaeological site. You take a decision that you'll use machines to remove plough soil. And talking to my Belgian colleagues, what surprised all of us is that there appear to be undisturbed human remains that close to the surface in an area that, as you can see, is, is regularly ploughed and has been since the end of the First World War. They believe the partly excavated trench holds the remains of two German soldiers. Is that all stuff up there, is it? I don't know if this is an arm or a leg at the moment. I can't see. I've got part of a ball joint down here with some cloth on top of it. We've got, looks like part of an in-situ hand up here. There seems to be a few fingers still together there. Police are called whenever human remains are found, so the team need a forensic anthropologist on site fast before police arrive to take the bones away. The first job of a forensic anthropologist is to hunt for clues to help identify human remains. Marit van den Bruyne is also trying to work out how many soldiers No Man's Land has found. So the easiest is to start with the long legs. If we see already two times a right femur, yeah, then we know we have two persons, yeah. And if they are all about the same age, then it's difficult to say which bone belongs to who. While Marit pieces together a human jigsaw, No Man's Land uncovers more clues, remnants of the soldiers' uniforms. The brass button seems to have survived quite well, but there's plenty of large bits of uh, uniform up the top here. Luke Barber is a forensic expert with the police force back in Britain. He's a specialist in working with evidence found alongside human remains. This is what we're wondering is whether we've actually got the best part of, of one body and bits of others. And if you do get someone who's been blown to pieces, then apparently one of the things that survives the best are, are the legs and the feet which are in the boots. So it may well be they're picking up limbs and dumping them down and burying them all together. So it's not necessarily a simple head count, because sometimes the heads are missing completely. Marit's examination tells her the men's age and details of their physiques. This results in an unexpected discovery the team have found the remains of three men, not two. So what I'm trying to do now is uh, the same bones I'm putting together. So the femurs with femurs, tibia, feet bones, arm bones. So it becomes a, a real puzzle. Nee, that's a hand. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what can we say about these bones? I could separate three individuals that were quite robustly built and they were surprisingly not so uh, tall. The height of this first individual, for example, is 1 meter 65. And if I compare this with myself, then it's about uh, 10 centimeters less than me, which is in, in fact small. For, uh, for a man. I can see things on bones, but uh, bones doesn't, they don't tell everything. I did my best. More evidence is pulled out of the trench where the bones were found. Possible clues as to the regiment these soldiers came from. What have we got? interesting yeah. was we did get a button which we could actually see something on finally. Yeah. We've got some with Prussian crowns, yep. it, but more interestingly, we've got this one here. That's a numeral. Which has got a number on it. Looks yeah. like number five, I think. That is important because that's going to be the company. Right. Um, so, number five company uh, of the, the regiment itself. That's good. Which means that if we can do a bit of research on the divisions that came through this area, what we can then do is to work out if in the battalion or regimental history mm. there is any mention of a map showing where number five company was. Right. Months of sleuthing pay off. 
German army records revealed that the button and the men who wore it came from a German regiment, the 213th Reserve. They can now track the doomed men from their training camp to their place of death, a journey they have decided to retrace themselves, a pilgrimage to gain insight into the mindset of war. So what we've got is this. We've got a single button and a location. Doesn't seem like much, but there's plenty to go on. That's the site of our project. It's the 213 Regiment, 213 Reserve Regiment, that actually takes this area and holds it. Right. So our, our job, I suppose, is now to go into Rendsburg itself, have a look at it, and then follow the rest of their route. Okay, let's go then. Yeah, a couple of days. Excellent. We only had partial remains, so we weren't able to this okay. time say this is a particular person, only that they came from a particular unit. So the idea of this trip is to take three of us, the same number as bodies that were found, and to retrace their route. Wearing their uniforms as a way of finding out what their experience could have been like. And having never been a soldier, it's a way of getting inside, I suppose, the, the, the mind of that man. Andy Robertshaw may never have been a soldier, but he spent his life studying armies, and he spends a great deal of time in uniform. Shoulder, das, gewehr. He wants the journey they're planning to run with military precision. No, try and hurry it. It's no race. Next. I think I'm right. Dan, you're not right. Try and put yourself back into line between the two of us. Try and face the front, and that weapon should be more square onto your shoulder. Are you happy with that? I guess it's not off at an angle. The training is going very well, actually. Um, the problem is, is my lack of German. I could probably do a great deal better if I could do the whole thing in English. But I'm trying to learn a completely new foot drill. What we'll then do is we'll then go to stand at ease. And I need someone to remind me, stand at ease. Rook. Oi, yes? Ruth, oi? Ruat, oi. Ruat, oi. Oi, oi. Oi, oi. Yes. Right, stand at ease. Which is? Ruth, oi. Like that. Comfy? Mm -hmm. If anybody um, knows me, they'll tell uh, you that I always have problems with foot drill. I learn it quite slowly. Uh, but trying to learn a new foot drill combined with orders in a foreign language is proving quite taxing. I've done it again. Um, um. um it's, it's so easy. Okay. Um. Good. Happy? Um. Good. Now we're going to get wet. Squad, prep, cover your arms. Normally the NCOs are standing a long way away, shouting orders from undercover just like this, and everybody gets more and more fed up. Um, but it's a way of getting the soldiers ready for being messed around because it's going to happen in action. And they're going to get wet and they're going to get miserable. So there's no point keeping everybody dry and comfy and hoping that war would work out to be nicely fought indoors in nice dry days. It's not like that. So the sooner the soldiers get used to it, the better. Halt! Squat. Bad weather? We're actually in the, the town of Rendsburg, and Rendsburg is where the reserve regiment, 213, uh, originally was formed uh, from local men. The people that we found uh, just north of Ypres um, were from the regiment, therefore from this area. But more specifically, they're from, um, well, at least one of them was from number five company. And in fact, if you come here, we've managed to match this rather well. Uh, that is the number five on the original button, dug up near Ypres. And that's our replica. That may actually be a real one, but it hasn't been in the ground for 90 years. So it's a single company of about 200 men um, from this area. There's uh, a fair bit of curiosity. You can see people looking. Yes. They don't actually come and ask. It's not been too bad, actually, no. is it? It's, it's looks which I was expecting. There wasn't any great angry mob chasing us around the square, which I was just, just a bit worried about. And. Um, yeah, it, it, it makes you feel the part a little bit to actually walk around the town in, in the correct costume. 
I mean, if you were doing house-to-house -house fighting... Long marches on foot demands tough men and tougher boots. Yeah, you know, creep up to a corner without anyone knowing that you were around there. So then when you swivel your foot, you really feel how skiddy it is. Yes. You've got irons on the heel, you've got them on the toe, and basically, you know, your boots will go on for on and on. And the only thing you're wearing out isn't the boot leather, you're wearing out the, the nails. But sometimes even these boots could not survive the pounding they received. Well, that's the heel of a boot, and the sole was here. The toe section is missing from the front here. There's part of it there, there's a piece of bone in it. It's some sort of decorated plate. Look. It's the brass plate which they had actually on the top of their leather helmets, the spiked helmets, the classic one. Um, don't know which uh, state this is. Looks like it could be Prussian. See the hobnails really quite clearly on that. We're wondering why on earth someone would actually put a helmet plate in their boot. It's a rather uncomfortable thing to have under your heel. Having now cleaned these boots out of soil, you can see part of his sock in here, but you can also see the, the heads of the hobnails actually come through the actual base of his boot. Now, number one shave. Don't you dare. Number no one hair. shave. Okay. No hair. No hair. No, 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 no. It's definitely Niles. But the thing is, look on the bright side. If we take all your hair off, your, your pickle hawk will fit better. <laughs> yeah, no. no. <laughs> I think. Just rub, just, just rub the outside. <laughs> the pickle hawk will fit better. This sort of idea that everybody had incredibly short hair isn't true. As a fashion, certainly by 1916 with the British Army, where you have it really long on top and short at the side, so not under a hat or a cap, you can't see it. Mm. Not unlike you've got now, so quite long. And if you look at it, I think some, some of the older men had really short hair, much more like Hindenburg, whereas the younger blokes like, like the hair a bit longer. Good. As far as possible, the army want you to be clean because it reduces the chance of infection, it gives you all sorts of problems if you are grubby. And it was enforced, so you would use your mess tin, you know, to have a wash. Start with your um, face, and then go to your armpits, and then feet, and then more personal after that, as far would as you could do every day. day. Would that be every morning? Then? Every day, if you could do, yeah, every day. What type of occupations would our three <laughs> chaps have done in civilian life? More think? likely to be heavy industry, there's steel works around here, there's heavy engineering. Agriculture. Agriculture, yeah, what we saw on the way in there, there are farms. So some of them could have been farm labourers, you know, that kind of thing. So they used to heavy work? I think all of them work. were. I, I, it occurred to me that it, some of the, the, the things that people say about the horrors of the war, like having, for example, to, to work in very dangerous conditions, um, well, these guys are doing it all the time. I mean, if you, you know if you're working in a steel mill and um, you've got a retort of steel and someone falls into it, you push them under. Didn't the anthropologists say they were short and muscular? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So from the bones we can tell they're fairly uh, well built and probably uh, used to manual labour. So what she could tell from the muscle attachments, could she? Yeah. If, if, if the bone's got large muscle attachments, it means they're obviously fairly muscular. So... Uh, that's good enough evidence, actually, from the bones themselves to say that these three chaps would have been used to physical labour. The men belonged to the 213th Reserve Regiment, Prussians in distinct Pickelhaube helmets, a unit formed only one month after war began. The unit was based in Rendsburg, where no man's land is starting their journey. It's a steel town built on heavy industry, industry that was critical to the German war effort, providing work for local men. We're actually on the Hochbruck Bridge, which spans the Kiel Canal, which was built just before the bridge was built. And for anybody in the town, in fact, for the town itself, it becomes the symbol of the area is this bridge has become so famous. I think going down is going to be worse than going up. Absolutely. The view is going to be fantastic. I was thinking about our workers. I mean, if they were farm labourers, this would have been absolutely staggering to look at it from a distance. If they were in the steel industry, well, probably some of the steel that they made went into the structure, but they might have been construction workers. 
the guys that came up here and built this. And if they'd taken part in that monumental bit of engineering, looking down at the canal, which is again monumental, looking at their navy going through it, they would have had this supreme feeling of confidence, which I think is what we get in the German army in 1914. That's better. Oh. Wow. Wow, what a view. Look at the shipping containers on that, they look and tiny. You can't even lose your helmet over the side. This canal is built to get their fleet from one side of Germany to the other. It all says basically preparations for war. It's almost inevitable. Yeah, I mean, just thinking about it, I'm, we're up here being saying, isn't this incredible? Um, it's what, 2005 now. This built, this bridge was finished in, in what, 1913. Mm. And it's just, I mean, I've presumably damaged during the Second World War, but this is an incredible piece of engineering. Mm. And I suppose if you were here, what, 1914, you'd have been able to see all the steelworks going, glowing in the dark, all the sulphurous fumes. You would have seen the horizon would have been covered Absolute. with smoke yeah. it, coming up from the factory. Mm. And it's men working hard in heavy industry, steam trains, the, the navy. It, uh, Germany must have looked unstoppable, if you mm. think about it. The remains of three German soldiers found in a trench in northern Belgium near Ypres have been traced back to a reserve regiment, the 213th. In September 1914, these men were called up with no choice about their service for what the Kaiser said would be a war that would be over before the leaves fell from the trees. Now the men from no man's land are retracing their journey boarding a train that would take them to Belgium and the Western Front. To Ypres, from where the men whose route they are following never returned. The white flower symbolises, I guess, peace or uh, purity, and uh, they would have been given to us, to the soldiers, uh, by their loved ones before they left. Um, sometimes in wreaths, sometimes just small flowers that they put in their hats or in their top buttons, just as a, as a farewell gift. Oh, your bus. 19. Oh, oh yes. For months, I win. Right, well, basically what I've got is some small change. It's about right, isn't it? Yeah. And that's actually the... Um, exact coin, or one of the exact coins, Belgian coins, that we found in the purse of our three soldiers of a big shotter. You get these mats of, of cloth or leather all pushed together and flattened, and you have to, literally, the luck of book, you do have to look between every little leaf, um, because you can get stuff that's tucked in between them. And with this piece of leather, I thought, well, this looks a little bit suspicious. It could well be a purse and when you open it up, you can see that still inside, you've got the coins as they were some 90 years ago. Fantastic. Oh, look right. at that. First time they've seen light of day for 90 years. Isn't that amazing? Just small change. Is that the I ones with the I holes think, in? I think uh, Mark has said that the ones with the holes in are probably Belgium. So they're well, using local, local currency. Yeah. But they're very distinctive because they've got the hole in the middle. There's no mistake in them. Yeah. We couldn't actually read very clearly what they were. Um, but we were, we were told by Mark DeWilde they were Belgium and this is definitely the right size and it's got the hole in the middle. Though we've been very kindly lent an original letter from a German soldier, his name is Wilhelm, he was in the 215th Reserve Infantry Regiment, which means he was actually next door to the 213th Reserve Infantry who our three chaps came from on the front line. So they're actually there together side by side. And this letter was written to his fiancée in October 1914 as he was travelling to the front. They're obviously in very high spirits as they chugged through the countryside looking out the windows uh, as it went by. The weather was good, like I said. Uh, and it was in autumn, and he was saying that the, the, the autumn colours were, were out. Um, what's particularly nice is, you know, he describes Belgium 
as they enter Belgium, but what a beautiful country it is with the rolling hills. What these words say is very much, I think, what our three soldiers probably would have been feeling as well. And the general feeling is, is upbeat. Everyone's singing as they cross the border, they're singing in German. And it's all like a large party. They're all quite happy, it's an adventure. Feels pretty good. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, it, I feel very comfortable in, this, in, in all this gear. Now that we've got all the webbing on and the pack and the helmet, it, it, I really feel the part, I feel great. Um, and in the train on this beautiful day, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I don't know where we're going, what our final destination is, but uh, with, with the other lads, I feel uh, really good, really confident. You know, back there is home, and you're going into the unknown that way, and everything you know and, and, and love that's dear to you is, is back there. And although you're going to a great adventure with your new mates, there's still a part of you who wants to you know, go back home. March. In the first weeks of the war, 11,000 trains ran round the clock, taking millions of German soldiers to the front. But they stopped at the Belgian border where tracks had been destroyed. So the Germans marched into Belgium, pushing through territory they were already calling the New Germany. On October the 19th, 1914, the men of the 213th arrived in the small Belgian town of Staden, following in the footsteps of the 215th. The story goes that on arrival, they were besieged by gunfire coming from the houses that surrounded them, fired on, as they thought, by the local townsfolk. But Andy Robertshaw thinks otherwise. In your letter, it says they were being fired up by townspeople. Yeah. From the sound of the French reports, it's the French army firing up. Yeah. As the Germans advanced under fire, the French pulled out, packing up their machine guns, but leaving the spent shells behind. With no opposing army in sight, the Germans assumed the locals had been shooting at them. So when the Germans come in, lots of spent cases, evidence of people shooting, yeah. who's here? The townspeople, yeah. no, not French soldiers. They get the blame for it. So they get the blame yeah. for it. In some ways, it makes a horrible logic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The contents of the letter written by Wilhelm reveals what happened next and how the German soldiers took revenge. Look, doesn't that letter mention that they, they spend the night in the fields? And yeah. They get shot, although there's lots of bullets all the time. Well, they say the, um, they arrived about 12 o'clock yeah. at midnight and they went into the town and were fired on from all sides. Yeah. And they stopped to look where the fire was coming from. They say it was from the houses. Which it would be. Yeah. Um, and then basically they uh, torched the place. Really? So they go around burning the houses down. And then like you say, they retired back out because they didn't have enough men no. to hold it. And so he says, and then they camped in a meadow. Yeah. And they were surrounded by the burning town, basically. And come the morning, they uh, muster and uh, go in fast to do the town properly. Yeah. And this time around, they go from door to door, breaking into the houses where they find local occupants, um, terrified, yes. a lot of them. And he actually mentions that some of them are on their knees. And he mentions that a lot of them are just killed outright, just like that. But it's just but the men is that they're killing? They're killing the men. He, he says he couldn't do it. Wilhelm says he couldn't do it, well, but he says it's happening. But he says he felt sorry for the women and children uh, who were terrified, but none of them were, were injured by their side. It's their first ever experience of warfare. They're now going from being reservists, called up a few weeks earlier, to now being in battle. And that experience of combat is confusing. It actually is difficult to, to make sense of. And there's no clear enemy. So what happens then is, to a certain extent, either the officers lose control or the men themselves make decisions that perhaps that they weren't in a position to, to, to be fully informed about. Either way, it ends up with civilians being killed. The invading Germans were gaining a reputation for barbarism, 
burning towns, executing civilians, raping and pillaging as they advanced. A meeting with the town registrar confirms the regiment's presence in the town and reveals the shocking truth of what happened on Black Monday, October the 19th, 1914, the day the German soldiers arrived. And these two were the archaeologists that um, were among the people that found the Germans. Uh, ah. But that's, that's why we're here. <laughs> okay. Uh, you have uh, one of your fellows here also. It was a real uh, 213. That's right. That's right. There we are. That's a list of uh, the German war graves here in Staden. Right. And we see that there was... The registrar has a list of German war graves in the town, which includes men from the 213th, proving conclusively they were there. So that actually shows, because we've been talking about Wilhelm, yes. who came here and describes this place in his letter. And he's from the 215th. Yes, which is next door. To so that's these. proof that yes. our boys were here. were here. Yes. On the Monday, the 19th, yeah. we uh, call it uh, Black Monday. Uh, right. Because in Ruslare, they uh, shot a lot of civ civilians yes. there. Mm. And also in Stalin, because we have the proof here, that's all uh, civilian who were uh, kept by the Germans yes. as hostage. I found it in the yard house. Wow. Nice to see oh, just, so we've just seen those names, it? haven't we, on the memorial. We counted 47. Mm. There's a woman there. Also a young boy. Yes. The, so, the, the parish priest also. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing in these cases, it always seems to the parish priest that, that, that yes. or, or that, that, that and the mayor seem to be the people that yes. suffer first. Um, yes. So Wilhelm was wrong. Well, Wilhelm, I think, was putting a bit <laughs> yeah. of a gloss in his letter. Saying that none uh, of the women and children were, were hurt. That's not... No. Back, in, back, to his, back to his letter, his, to his fiancée. Yeah. He writes that none of the yeah. women and children were hurt. And we thought to ourselves... Well, mm, didn't uh, write it. It's yeah, not the, the sort of thing you would yeah. want to tell your fiancée. Putting those those faces to some of the yeah. we re arrived in this town. We knew that it was going to be, you know, a, a, an odd thing to do. But now, having seen the memorial, heard more about it, and seen the images, it, you, know, well, you can't say anything. The hostages included children, women, and the parish priest. Civilians, the registrar says, were used by the soldiers as human shields then murdered. The thing that struck us was just the number of people, there's 47, and then putting names to faces or faces to names was something mm. else. At least three women on the, in the photos. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the other thing was, that, I mean, you were saying that the Wilhelm in his letter says, you know, that the that women weren't killed. Yeah. And it, he seems to say they were killed sort of in the heat of action. Was what, what we're hearing is that they were used as a human shield. Mm. So if just killing people you know, because you think they've been shooting at you is reprehensible. Mm. The human shield thing. Well, this is after the event. They've clicked round these people up, marched them off, yeah. and then used them as a shield, and then shot them. Oh. So you've got, but what you've got is you've got now. We, we've now had a, a, a different uh, account yeah. of the events. Wilhelm's letter says that it's house to house fighting. Yes, that's right. That women and children aren't hurt, but. You could forgive a few soldiers maybe for, for shooting the odd woman in the heat of battle, bursting through a door, seeing a figure and firing. Yeah. But we're hearing here a totally different story. So these people are rounded up, marched down the road and then shot. It's very, very strange, to, to be honest, to be wearing a uniform that is the same as the men who were here in 1914. It's what the uniform represents is what makes it disturbing to me because it was an atrocity. And it doesn't matter why it happened, it did. It's a historical fact. And in some ways, it's completely explicable. But at the same time, uh, the death of civilians in war is far, far worse than the death of soldiers. On the whole, soldiers are expected to happen. For, soldiers, for the civilians, that they don't. Wilhelm's letter says after the shootings, the Germans camped on the outskirts of the town. Staying true to their journey, no man's land are doing the same. How about that bit there? 
Yeah. This, is a bit, this is good. That's fairly good, isn't it? It's fairly soft. There isn't much poo in it. It's a very similar situation here like the three soldiers we found on the archaeological excavation. They may well have camped in this very field. And it would have been a, a scene very similar to this except a lot more of them. 200, 300 men in a field like this. Rinse that out first, hang on. Get a little bit there. Tiny bit in there. Rinse that out. Oh my God. We're going to eat this stuff. So what, show me. That's fine. Oh God. Oh, yeah, but, <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say that's gone off. Yeah, open it up a bit more. <laughs> Don't be a whingy. Mmm. <laughs> Last night I had calamari. <laughs> Tonight I've got dog food. <laughs> I wish I'd said that there. <laughs> oh, that's disgusting. Oh, oh God, he's giving birth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, what's that? It's a penis. Is <laughs> that? <laughs> I can see why the Germans went in there in a bad mood the next day. <laughs> As night falls, the mood becomes more somber. Tomorrow they go to the front. The last leg of their trek, next stop, Ypres where the first trenches were dug, where trench warfare was born, and our three soldiers died. When the men of the 213th Regiment reached Ypres in October 1914, they were part of a new wave of German troops. Back up first. Quarter of a million strong, the plan was to capture Paris, destroy the French and British armies, then turn on Russia in the east. But the plan failed. Once they start shooting, we'll have more sense. The French held their ground. They fought ferociously and stuck fast. The Germans had no choice but to dig in where they could. Our German soldiers arriving here would have known shrapnel bursts overhead would have told them, dig quickly. The quicker you dig, the safer you are. The saying was throughout the war, sweat saves blood. The more you sweat now, the safer you'll be when the attack comes in, when the artillery opens fire. You're going to be able to get your ass down as well. Being shot in the ass has been as bad as being shot anywhere else. Just keep digging it out. No Man's Land are reliving the experiences of the German soldiers whose remains they found in these very fields. I'm digging this temporary trench, this scoop, which has got been a leak in my body. I haven't got time to dig a deep trench because I'm going to get shot at it. So it's just enough to be my length, cover my body, and all the stuff that I dig up goes in front of me, take out a little space so I can see the enemy and I can get my gun in position and, and then fire at them but still be protected and then hopefully one of us can give covering fire whilst the other two continue to dig but I'm about there just I need to look a bit more off when they first came here five months earlier no man's land's mission was to find the first trenches ever dug for the great war if you look across there, you can see the guy standing up in the trench. And then you can see the guy to the left crouched down. So you look at the silhouette against the horizon. Yeah, so you need to get down low so that you don't, effectively don't become a target for small arms fire or artillery. Records showed that the first trenches were dug here. Shallow scrapes hastily hollowed out under fire in a war that was still about movement, but that would soon become entrenched. We've got groups of men in little scrapes, two or three men in each trench, and it's not continuous. The, the, 
the Prussians, the Germans are advancing. The pressure of the advance pushes this lot back. They pull back across the other side of the field. And there, instead of making little scrapes, they decide to make a stand and they, they gradually join up the scrapes so they've got a continuous trench. And suddenly you've got a position where you've got a trench that people can move up and down on and instead of just sitting in a hole. And um, you've moved from field combat to trench combat. It's the birth of trench warfare. The 213th reserves who were fighting this part of the line eventually pushed back the French and took over their trenches. They were determined to hold on to their advantage, so they dug in deep, improved and reinforced. Well, we're dealing with the sun back here. Mostly we just have the marks of the sun back, not the textile uh, preserved. So this is very valuable, I think. It's also very difficult to recover it as a whole. We'll try, but we're not sure we whether go. it's going Let to work go. or not. Try and go in right below it and put your fingers up. Yeah, so... She's there, right? Yeah. Hang on, hang on. We've got it. All right. Yeah, yeah. Woohoo! Yes, we've got it! She's there. Fingers on. So quite a beautiful sandbag. Impressive. Jump that again. Two thirds full. Is that two thirds one. full. Yeah. Choke That's around the thirds. outside. That's it. Right, wait for it. Now, remember what I told you. You see me showing. Good, out of the way. Fantastic. We know from what we did before with the archaeology just the other side of the road that this is where trenches began. This is the line on which the French armies stopped the German assault in October 1914. Uh, they were then pushed back. When they were pushed back, the Germans came in and improved the system. And in fact, what you can see and what we're reconstructing now, the archaeology shows us firstly earth, very shallow scrapes just out of the earth, then them all joining up to give us what we now know as a trench system. And what we're digging here is doing this within a few yards of where it really happened. In fact, just a couple of minutes ago, as we were working, uh, we weren't doing archaeology as such, but we found this, which is just the base of a German spiked helmet, the Pickelhaub, which says that somebody was here doing exactly the same as we were doing at exactly the same depth, wearing the same uniforms. Uh, one more you can imagine a whole line of them, like we are dressed, you know, with, with the grey trousers the, and the blue shirts and the braces, all the way along there, except here, uh, digging in like that. And our three were probably amongst that group of men. It was at this place that the Germans dug deep, marking the birth of trench warfare for the Great War. So when No Man's Land found the remains of their three German soldiers on this site five months earlier, they knew it meant they were at the right spot, at the very place where trench warfare had begun. Oops. Digging deeper below the German fortifications, they hoped to find the original trench layout, a remnant of the very first ever dug for modern warfare, something that changed it forever. No Man's Land succeeded in locating one of the very first trenches dug at the beginning of the Great War. This is something that no one's ever seen before. People have done archaeology of the Great War and they've looked at 1915, 16, 17. Normally it's late war. This, which looks so much like a three-person fire pit, very, very, very crudely made, is the first time anything like this ever been seen. But everything in here is early war. It, cannot be 1917 or 18. This is you know, one of the very first trenches. What we've done here is to build our replica of a trench of the type that would have been dug end of 14, beginning of 15, as trenches improved. It's got all the features that you should have in a trench. It's got a, a lower area which allows you to walk along without getting too 
exposed to enemy fire. You've then got the fire step that you can stand on to shoot, sleep on. You've got an area called the berm, which allows then, well here, you can see what's gone onto it. Uh, really it's to stop the earth falling back straight into your trench. And then the parapet, and the parapet we've been able to use sandbags. Germans were using basically any form of bed linen. It would have been much more variegated. This is very even. So the top, yeah. But this is very much the sort of thing that they would have done literally just across uh, in the field over there that's now ploughed. And so, yeah, in a way, we've, we've, we've come all the way from Rendsburg, where they were, and we are literally, what, 20 metres away from their trench. The whole basis of no man's land has been excavating trenches. It was never set up to find human remains. But when we find them, the idea of being able to identify them, to give them some humanity back, is, is what it's about. We had the opportunity this time to go and see where they came from, follow their route, come back and stand here where the, the human remains were found. Three casualties buried together. It seems that initially that they were all in the same space. So that says to me a shell hole or a grave prepared by German soldiers. But whoever buried them, it was very, very shallow. That says to me men in a hurry, men really under pressure to get their mates just underground. That's all they were doing. Not a proper burial. Three nameless German soldiers and some innocent civilians died at the dawn of trench warfare. Fighting in trenches stalemated the war for four years, so no one got home before the leaves fell and millions never got home at all. <laughs>